Have you heard of Gobekli Tepe? It's an ancient site in Turkey that literally made historians rewrite history books. Over 11,000 years ago, a group of prehistoric humans crafted an enigmatic masterpiece that's even older than Stonehenge. Before its discovery, archaeologists believed that people didn't know about iron and weren't good at making pottery. They were sure that settled life only emerged with the need for agriculture. But Gobekli Tepe changed this belief. The place has revealed that it was the temple that paved the way for a settled life, not agriculture. Until this discovery, researchers believed that farming was the catalyst for sedentary living. Meet Professor Schmidt, the guy whose findings changed this theory. He managed to prove that hunter-gatherer communities laid the very foundations of this way of life. Back in the 1960s, other archaeologists visited the area, but they totally missed the mark. While surveying the region, they stumbled upon a hill with scattered limestone slabs and concluded it was just an old burial ground from medieval times. Little did they know that there was so much more to uncover. In 1994, Schmidt embarked on his own survey of prehistoric sites in the area. Surprise! He instantly realized he had discovered something truly extraordinary. Unlike the nearby flat and barren plateaus, Gobekli Tepe had a gently rounded top rising 50 feet above the surrounding landscape. Funny enough, the translation of this place's name is Potbelly Hill. Schmidt was sure only humans could have made something like this. Those broken limestone pieces that were mistaken for gravestones turned out to be way more exciting. It was like stumbling upon a hidden treasure. The pieces took on a whole new meaning, and Schmidt with his team was about to dive into the secrets waiting beneath the surface. To their surprise, they found no traces of a settlement, no hearths for cooking, no houses, and none of those adorable clay figurines commonly found in nearby sites of similar age. However, they uncovered that those ancient people used tools like stone hammers. So, Schmidt and his team put their heads together and took a wild guess at the age of Gobekli Tepe's stone structures. Their estimation got backed up by some limited carbon dating done right at the site. The ancient vibes of this place were finally starting to make sense. It was like a puzzle slowly coming together. You may think that back then, people didn't have special tools to create something as cool as Gobekli Tepe. Not true. Turns out, these prehistoric folks used flint tools instead of fancy metal chisels. They were also skilled at chipping away softer limestone and crafting pillars right on the spot. Afterward, they carried the pillars a short distance to the summit and placed them upright. Once the stone rings were complete, they covered them with layers of dirt. Over time, they added new rings, and voila. You've got a cool hill to impress people in the future. During their first year of excavation, the team went through 15,000 pieces of animal bones from wild creatures. These people didn't have pet animals or grow their own food. They hunted wild animals for their meals. But things were about to change because the place had everything they needed to start farming. Scientists say they had wild sheep and wild grains that could be domesticated. And guess what? Just 20 miles away, geneticists found evidence of the world's oldest domesticated strains of wheat at a prehistoric village. These amazing findings have completely changed how we view civilization. In the past, experts believed that people needed to learn how to farm and settle in one place before they could build temples and develop complex societies. But guess what? Schmidt's research flips that idea on its head. He claims that the incredible effort put into constructing these astonishing structures actually set the stage for the development of advanced societies. It means that societal and cultural changes happened before agriculture. Schmidt has this fascinating hypothesis about Gobekli Tepe. He thinks it could have been a special burial site where people left their loved ones. And here's the twist. 
The burial site was adorned with fancy statues and symbols representing deities from the spiritual realm. The idea that Gobekli Tepe could have served as a sacred place adds another layer of complexity to the whole story. While the site's true purpose may remain elusive, Schmidt's insights invite us to consider the profound interplay between life and the afterlife, and the deep reverence ancient hunter-gatherer societies may have had for their departed ancestors. Now let's talk about the stars of the show, the mesmerizing T-shaped columns that dominate Gobekli Tepe. These mysterious structures range from 10 to 20 feet tall and most likely represent stylized human figures, but one figure stands out from the rest, the three-dimensional lion relief. This depiction really fires up our imagination. Why? Because it hints at the possibility that lions roamed Anatolia during the Neolithic period. These standing stones are arranged in circles and placed in rectangular pits. Each circle has a similar setup, two big T-shaped pillars in the center, surrounded by slightly smaller ones facing inward. Talk about a stylish arrangement. These towering pillars reach a whopping 16 feet and weigh between 7 and 10 tons. Some pillars are plain and simple, while others are like works of art with intricate carvings. Foxes, scorpions, and vultures come to life, crawling and twisting on the pillar's sides. But it's not just animals depicted on these stones. Some pillars have abstract shapes representing humans, and even small carvings of clothing items. Some of them even have belts. Now, there's one pillar that stands out from the rest like a rock star. This super old stone pillar suggests that a comet crashed into Earth. It happened during a chilly period that lasted about a thousand years. Previous studies examining Greenland ice cores hinted at this comet theory, but now the carvings at Gobekli Tepe prove it right. The carvings on the pillars are like a historical comic strip. They even show a headless human figure. Researchers fed the images into a computer and discovered their connections to constellations, indicating that this temple might have been an ancient observatory. It's like our ancestors were trying to document this cataclysmic event in their own unique way. Archaeologists have been excavating and researching Gobekli Tepe since the mid-1990s, peeling back layers of history and providing us with a deeper understanding of the intricate relationship between various elements. They have no plans to stop the whole process for another 150 years. Who knows what else they'll find? You see, Gobekli Tepe has been labeled purely as a ritual site with no signs of domestic activities. We were led to believe that the absence of water meant it couldn't support semi-sedentary communities. But scientists believe it's time to shake things up and approach Gobekli Tepe with fresh eyes. It's time to question what we believed before and use new evidence and different ways of thinking. Like, there might have been a group of people living in the area who didn't stay in one place all the time. They moved around a bit, but still had their own civilization, living in the area semi-sedentarily. Gobekli Tepe is not just home to a single temple, but an astounding collection of over 20 ancient structures. As archaeologists delve into the depths of this wonder, they are unraveling its unique layout, featuring two prominent focal points at the heart of each establishment, complemented by smaller structures and dividing walls. What's even crazier is that in this area, there are over 200 obelisks, which are narrow tapering monuments. It's nighttime, and you're about to walk inside Pharaoh Tutankhamun's final resting place. You know, King Tut. You don't have a torch, but at least you came with a flashlight. You walk down several flights of stairs and observe how the walls are carved in hieroglyphics and what looks like a spell. Those who take anything from this place will be doomed for life, the spell says. Even if you don't really believe it, this scares you a little bit. You find a huge stone door. Is it a trap? You manage to open it, but oh no, it's only an empty chamber. You check your map. It seems like you're heading in the right direction. After what feels like hours, you realize you must be trapped inside a labyrinth. You try to retrace your steps, but you can't find the door where you came in from anymore. That's it, you think to yourself. You've fallen for the pharaoh's trap. What's worse, you didn't bring a lunch.
Ok, so we've all seen Hollywood movies where the main character is exploring ancient ruins and faces some seriously dangerous traps, right? We've been told Egyptian royalty protected their final resting places with venomous scorpions and snakes, sliding doors that will trap you for life, and giant rolling boulders that will crush anyone on their paths. The thing is, were these traps truly real? Well, I regret to be the one to break it to you, but this is all fiction. These elaborate traps were too technologically advanced for ancient civilizations to pull off. That is not to say, however, that there weren't any traps at all. Ancient civilizations, like the Egyptians and the Mayans, are known for their practice of building entire monuments dedicated to the ones who had passed away. These structures would often reflect the position of person occupied in society. So, for the really important people, the VIPs of their times, massive monuments were built to host their bodies long after they were gone. Some of these civilizations believed that a person's life would continue on the other side of the veil. For that reason, a person would be buried together with the belongings of their current life. If they had a lot of money and power and stuff, that meant their resting places would be filled with riches and gold. Now imagine if you lived in ancient Egypt, and you knew exactly where all the pharaoh's tombs were located, and had heard rumors of the amount of wealth kept in these places. Maybe you would be tempted to go check it out, right? We're talking about large rooms filled from floor to ceiling with golden artifacts, jewels, and even money. I mean, it does sound tempting. And since there weren't any security guards protecting the entrance of these places, Egyptians needed to get creative as to how they would protect these riches. These old civilizations found some traps to be useful. A recurring one was building empty rooms inside the monument to confuse a burglar. Now, let's take a look at Amenhotep III's final resting place as an example. It was built in the city of Luxor, in a spot also known as the Western Valley of the Kings. Two French engineers originally discovered the monument between 1905 and 1914 CE. The structure is huge and has more than 10 chambers, connected by long corridors and steep stairways. The king's chamber is the most hidden one, and for an outsider to try and find it, they will probably enter a lot of empty rooms beforehand. Other pharaohs tried to protect their riches by commissioning monuments with false doors concealing pits that were up to 20 feet deep. This way, an unwarned and unwanted visitor would be surprised by the deep hole on their way to the king's resting chamber. Alongside false doors, pharaohs made sure to build labyrinth-style corridors and false walls. This way, robbers could take hours or days before they found the king's real chamber. As to pits with poisonous snakes on them, if there were any reptiles inside these monuments, they probably got inside on their own and would most likely not stay there for long. There is no way snakes would survive years and years without food inside these pits. So yes, another Hollywood-induced belief right there. If these traps seem boring to you, archaeologists did find an interesting deterrent in the final resting place of the Red Queen of Polenque in Mexico. Polenque was one of the most powerful Mayan cities in pre-Columbian Mexico. And the Red Queen was believed to be the grandmother of the last Mayan king, undoubtedly a person of immense importance to the empire. In her honor, a huge monument was built to keep her body after her passing. The discovery of the tomb itself was already thrilling. Archaeologists found an ancient monument when digging at the site back in 1994. The first thing they found was a room with a hidden door. Once they opened the door, they discovered a long corridor. Finally, at the end of this corridor was the Queen's Chamber. The team of archaeologists was beyond excited to unearth this chamber with the mummy of the Queen herself still inside it. They found her to be accompanied by her pearls, jade shells, and expensive rocks. But as the team explored the remains, they saw something rather strange. The room was filled with a red-colored powder. Researchers knew that the color red was important to the Mayan people, and that much of their clothing and buildings were decorated with this color. But they didn't understand why the queen was buried with this unknown red substance. 
after they took a sample back with them for further analysis, they discovered that the red powder was cinnabar, a very dangerous mineral. This powder, when inhaled, can cause, shall we say, severe health damage to a person. The team concluded that this could only be a trap for anyone trying to steal her riches. Okay, so dangerous powders might have worked as the most intense traps we've seen until now. But perhaps the cheapest way to keep out unwanted visitors was to advertise spells written out all over the monument. We'd probably laugh at these today, but back in the day, they were more or less effective. Spells usually said that the person who took anything from that place would meet a tragic fate. Some spells said that robbers would lose their houses in big fires or terrible floods. Other spells said burglars would have incurable and undiagnosed health issues, but they weren't really enough to stop people from taking any gold. There are some stories surrounding how these spells might have been real. One of them is from the famous British Egyptologist Howard Carter, the one responsible for unearthing Pharaoh Tutankhamun's resting place in the 1920s. After months of unsuccessful digging, Carter discovered the tomb's existence by chance. He found the entrance to a stairway right beneath the soil where he had been searching all those months. With the help of a team, he cleared the piles of sand blocking the stairs and discovered a doorway. The door had several royal symbols carved into it, and Carter knew this could only mean a very important person had been buried there. And he was right. With a chisel, he made a hole in the top left-hand corner of the doorway and lit his vision with the help of a candle. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. The reflection of several golden and jeweled items crowding the chamber before him. Lost for 3,000 years, Carter had just discovered the final resting place of King Tut. But the story didn't finish here. This discovery was accompanied by a series of unfortunate events that led people to believe it had something to do with the pharaoh's spell. Carter himself mysteriously passed away just a few years later. And some of his assistants lost their houses in floods, just like one of the spells threatened. Some say it's just coincidental, as there's no real proof of these things being connected. Well, what do you think? Was this an effective trap after all? At some point in its long and very interesting history, our dear planet Earth was sort of snoozing, just doing its planetary thing, spinning around the sun. And then, bam, life starts getting fancy. Plants and animals start strutting their stuff, showing off their complexity. Fast forward a bit, about 65 million years ago to be exact, and a cosmic disaster strikes. Or at least that's what we presume. An asteroid probably smashed into Earth, wiping out the dinosaurs and other big animals. We can't pinpoint specifics about the asteroid. But we do know that it was extremely large and it crashed into our precious planet, creating a dusty mess that settled everywhere. You can still find remnants of that dust layer in sedimentary rocks today. If you dig beneath it, you'll uncover a whole bunch of fossils. These prehistoric creatures were living it up before the asteroid crashed the party. Think of it as the planet going on a cleaning spree, leaving a bunch of empty spaces waiting to be filled. And guess who took the opportunity? Mammals! These furry little critters were the ones to rise to fame. But why is it that this disaster became such a great opportunity for mammals? It's pretty simple, actually. With no big bullies around, they grew, multiplied, and had a population expanse. All kinds of mammals joined to fill in the blanks. Primates, rodents, basically. The whole furry gang. We're talking about placental mammals, marsupials, and even egg-laying mammals, adding some serious variety to the mix. We like to think of primates as our closest relatives here on Earth. What's their story? Well, around 63 million years ago, just a couple of million years after the dinosaurs' final dance, the primates decided it was time for a family reunion. They split into two groups, the dry-nosed primates, who became the cool monkeys and apes we know today, and the wet-nosed primates, who went off to become lemurs and eye-eyes, hey hayes. The fun didn't stop there. About 58 million years ago, the dry-nosed primates began their own little mission. 
One special guest called the Tarsier, Tarsier, arrived on the scene, featuring big eyes that were perfect for late night shenanigans. This Tarsier took a different path from its primate relatives, embracing its unique niche and evolving separately. To this day, the Tarsier is the only primate that feeds exclusively on meat. These little guys have a taste for insects, small birds, rodents, and even lizards. But that's not all that makes them unique. Their eyes are twice the size of their brains. Also, their heads can do a full 180 degree spin, just like an owl. Because of their features, the Tarsiers are the true kings and queens of the night. With their superpower of ultrasonic tracking, they can spot their prey instantly. Plus, their legs and feet are like springs ready to launch them into action. They've got this special ankle bone called the Tarsus, which gives them those epic leaping skills. Hence the name, if you were wondering. But let's leave these little critters to rest and get back to our story, shall we? About 55 million years ago, the Earth cranked up the heat, literally. This sudden hot pod was a bit too much for many deep ocean dwellers and plants to handle, and they bid their farewells. But hey, every goodbye is an opportunity for something new, right? The oceanic mammals known as cetaceans, cetaceans, saw their chance and took it. They splashed into those empty niches, becoming the rulers of the sea. In this category of creatures, you can find the blue whale and the dolphin. A special primate guest made an appearance around 47 million years ago. Scientists now affectionately call the fossil of such a creature, Ida. This little wonder caused quite a stir. Initially hailed as the missing link in human evolution. But here's the hilarious part. It turned out Ida was not one of us dry-nosed primates, but a cheeky wet-nosed one. Moving forward to 40 million years ago. This is when another big event happened in the primate world. The New World monkeys, our distant cousins, decided to take a different path and branch off from our lineage of Old World monkeys. They packed their bags and set off to conquer South America, where they're still living it up today. What's the difference between the two, you might ask? Well, one crucial thing that sets them apart is the fact that the Old World monkeys had nostrils that pointed downwards. Around 25 million years ago, another troop of apes entered the scene, and these guys had something special, the lack of a tail. These unique creatures would go on to become our closest relatives. We're talking apes and great apes, the cool gang who share a whole lot of genetic similarities with us. The first ape to break free from the monkey madness was the gibbon. About 18 million years ago is when this little acrobat swung into the picture. A few million years later, the great apes made their grand entrance too. Orangutans were the pioneers venturing into the wilds of Southern Asia. We're getting closer and closer to the present. It was seven million years ago when the great apes took a major fork in the evolutionary road. One path led to our ancestors, the future Homo sapiens, and the other path led to chimpanzees and bonobos. These two primate branches remained united for a few million years before finally going their separate ways. 5.6 million years ago, a game-changing ape called Ardipithecus made its way into our evolutionary history. It had a special talent, bipedalism. That's right, this was one of the first apes to walk on two feet probably making its primate buddies raise an eyebrow or two. The real showstoppers, however, arrived around 4 million years ago, the Australopithecus crew. These were the earliest members of the Hominina Home Inina subtribe, our tribe. What made them so special? Well, probably the fact that they brought some serious tools to the game. Stone tools, to be precise. It seems that at some point in their evolution, these clever primates started using stones to make their lives easier. Now here comes a crucial turning point in our story. About two million years ago, our ancestors faced a food shortage. Survival of the fittest was the name of the game, and two strategies emerged. Group one went for stronger jaws, allowing them to chomp on tough foods like nuts. Group two had a different idea. They opted for weaker jaws, but bigger brains. 
they wanted access to a wider range of food options. Obviously, the bigger-brained group took the prize. And here's where our gang comes into play. Around 2.5 million years ago, a type of primate also known as Handyman made its mark on history. These clever beings had larger brains and knew how to put those neurons to good use. About 1.9 million years ago, a new star emerged, Homo erectus. These creatures not only walked upright, but also had brains that were almost twice the size of the Handyman's. They took the world by surprise, becoming the first of our direct ancestors to venture out of the African continent. They even knew how to tame fire. Approximately 700,000 years ago, the world witnessed a culinary revolution. The earliest evidence of cooking appeared. And around 500,000 years ago, our ancestors decided it was time to become a bit more fashionable, donning the first evidence of clothing. Our very own species came to be just 300,000 years ago. Told you we were late to the party. But the world was never the same after the appearance of Homo sapiens, the anatomically modern humans. Alongside our other relatives, we emerged, ready to conquer the world with our innovative minds and complex societies. The exact path of our evolution remains a bit of a mystery. But what we do know for sure is that Neanderthals joined the party around at some point too. As Homo sapiens flourished, so did our capacity for language. Modern speech is believed to have emerged almost hand in hand with our species. We started expressing ourselves, sharing stories, and shaping the world with our words. So, there you have it. It took 13.8 billion years of cosmic history for humans to make their entrance. Think about it. 99.998% of the time since the Big Bang, we weren't even around. Our species, Homo sapiens, is the toddler of the Earth's family, existing for just the tiniest fraction of the universe's timeline. Yet, in this blink of an eye, we've managed to unravel the entire story that led to our existence. The story won't end with us. It's an ongoing saga, still being written with every passing moment. On October 30th, 1759, the inhabitants of the Middle East were jolted awake by an earthquake. Cracks appeared in the walls of their homes. Roofs began to crumble. People ran out of their homes and gathered in open areas. But because of strong shocks, they kept losing their footing and falling. A month later, there was another earthquake, but it turned out to be even stronger. Trees broke, houses collapsed, deep cracks appeared in the ground. The disaster lasted for two minutes. Oases, roads, and cities were destroyed. Incredibly, Baalbek's ancient buildings withstood earthquakes. Some historians state that this majestic and mysterious place was built during the Roman Empire, but many researchers disagree. Whatever the truth is, the city is one of the main archaeological phenomena of humankind. The most amazing building of Baalbek is the Temple of Jupiter. The inhabitants of the Roman Empire believed that Jupiter held power over lightning and thunder. The building looked like a platform with 54 columns. A massive roof rested on these columns. Today, you can only see six 70-foot-high columns. Each of them consists of three sections and resembles a pencil. The cores of these pencils were made of lead. This made the columns exceptionally strong. Each of these pieces of stone weighed an incredible 80 tons. That's the weight of 35 Ford Explorer SUVs. Look, this is the largest block in the Great Pyramid of Giza. But compared to the blocks from Baalbek, it doesn't even look that impressive. The foundation under the Temple of Jupiter was preserved. That's how specialists figured out it consisted of about 25 monolithic stones weighing 450 tons each. It means that the blocks from Baalbek weigh almost four times more than the blocks from Egypt. There are three more enormous limestone blocks in the foundation. They weigh 800 tons each. This is more than twice the weight of a Boeing 747 plane. Ancient builders must have had a hard time carving such giants from a piece of stone. And after that, they also had to pull them to the construction site and lift them to a significant height. Repeating these logistics would probably turn out to be a nightmare for present-day builders. To do this amount of work, they would need modern equipment. But Baldex constructors didn't have trucks, cranes with circular saws, or electricity. How did the builders of the past manage to do this? 
Scientists have a theory that includes ropes, winches, and lever systems. Naturally, the engineers of the past made all the gadgets from wood. Around 3,000 feet away from the ruins of the temple complex, there's a quarry. Archaeologists suppose that's where the stones for the construction were cut. They found a block of limestone there. It seemed to be too large even for this incredible place. The monolith got called the Stone of the South. It was 65 feet long and 13 feet wide. The ancient builders didn't have time to completely separate it from its mother rock. A group of scientists from Austria estimated that this piece of limestone weighed more than 1,000 tons. That's like three Boeing aircraft or 160 African elephants. There was another surprise awaiting the archaeologists near the Stone of the South. It was the second monolith that weighed more than 1,200 tons. But the ancient builders didn't stop at that. They continued to work. In 2014, in the same quarry, German archaeologists unearthed a block that weighed 1,650 tons. No one has figured out yet why people of the past needed a piece of stone that weighed as much as 125 school buses. It's also unclear how they were going to move this giant and why they didn't finish the job. In any case, this third monolith is the largest processed piece of stone in human history. There are more questions than answers. Some researchers believe that people of the past had high-tech equipment. Others don't think so, but are eager to understand how the builders managed to move those stones. There's a huge number of ancient buildings and artifacts on the planet. Lots of them make researchers scratch their heads. Near the Pyramid of Djoser in Egypt, archaeologists have found a network of tunnels. This place is called Serapium. It contains 24 sarcophagi, weighing from 70 to 100 tons. The giant boxes are carved from a single piece of granite and covered with heavy lids. The sarcophagi are perfectly symmetrical. To the touch, their walls are as smooth as glass. Even with the current level of technology, this is very difficult to do. But the ancient Egyptians managed this feat. The Lycurgus Cup is a priceless artifact and example of ancient nanotechnology. It's made of glass that can change its color. If you put a source of light in front of the cup, it turns green. If the light is behind the goblet, it becomes deep red. In this case, the figure of Greek king Lycurgus turns pale purple. Scientists understood how this color change worked only at the end of the 20th century. Through microscopes, they saw nanoparticles of silver, gold, and copper. They had been added to the glass matrix. Thanks to this, you can observe a color change called dichroism. Interestingly, the gold and silver were grounded into a fine dust. It's almost impossible to do this by accident. Most likely, the ancient experts knew for sure what they were doing. Bolivia has a curious place called Puma Punku. It looks as if an ancient giant played there with an enormous construction set. And after the game, they forgot to put the pieces back into the box. But there are no giants, and the huge stone blocks were carved by ancient builders over 1,500 years ago. Some of the rocks weigh 100 tons. The blocks were brought to an altitude of almost 13,000 feet above sea level from the quarry 60 miles away from the construction site. There's no forest in that area. This means the builders couldn't use trees to make wooden rollers. The monument belongs to the Inca civilization. Scientists are sure they didn't know anything about wheels. In 1992, the inhabitants of a Chinese village decided to drain a pond. Their ancestors had been using it to wash clothes and catch fish for hundreds of years. They kept pumping the water out for 17 days. At the bottom of the reservoir, they made an unexpected discovery. The villagers saw an entrance to a cave going down to a depth of 100 feet. The incredible find was named the Long Yu Caves. Unknown builders carved out 320,000 square feet of galleries. There are separate rooms, bridges, pools, and columns that support the ceiling. The walls of the cave are covered with strange carved lines and patterns. Scientists haven't found any information about who built the caves and why they did it. The construction technology also remains a mystery. Antonio Stradivari lived in Italy in the 18th century. He created musical instruments. More than 600 of his works have survived to this day. 500 of them are violins. One of the instruments was sold at auction for $16 million. The violins made by this master sound clear and deep. Researchers can't understand why Stradivarius instruments produce such unique sounds. Perhaps it's all about the varnish the master used to cover the violins. The answer may also lie in the wood the instruments are made of. 
In those days, Europe had a cold climate. Because of this, the wood became denser, and the instruments made of it sounded especially pleasing to the ear. In the Indian city of Delhi, there's a 23-foot high pole. It weighs six and a half tons and is made of 98% wrought iron. The 1,600-year-old pillar has no signs of rust or decay. Scientists believe that the monument is so well-preserved thanks to the dry weather and the chemical composition of the metal. It might be resistant to corrosion. And still, researchers don't know how the blacksmiths managed to make an iron pillar that's not afraid of rust. It seems like a tough feat, even for modern metallurgists. The Al Nasla rock is divided into two parts by a perfectly straight slit. Each boulder stands on a small pedestal. Some people believe this is the evidence of ancient laser technology. But geologists think the split happened due to the ground shifting or natural vibrations that occurred under the rock. This process led to the appearance of the crack. It had been deepening for thousands of years, and gradually, the natural monument took the form you can see today. So how come the world is still talking about a statue that only existed for a mere 54 years over 2,000 years ago? What made this impressive ancient construction so remarkable that we're still discussing it? I'm talking about the Colossus of Rhodes, of course. It's considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, along with the Great Pyramid of Giza or the Gardens of Babylon. There are a lot of mysteries surrounding this ancient statue, but let's look at some of the facts first, shall we? What we do know is that the local Rhodians decided to start a massive project once a Macedonian siege over their island was over. In other words, it was their way of honoring the higher powers for their victory. Using a lot of material left behind by the Macedonians, they started the construction of the Colossus, which is estimated to have taken about 12 years. Most contemporary descriptions of the sculpture agree that it stood about 105 feet tall. Now, just to compare, that's about the size of the Statue of Liberty today, which is 151 feet tall. It may not seem like a lot. I mean, Lady Liberty is currently ranked as the 52nd tallest statue in the world. The champion here would be the Statue of Unity in India, standing proud at an astonishing 597 feet. But for ancient times, that was quite an accomplishment. But is the similar height the only connection between the Colossus of Rhodes and the Statue of Liberty? Not really. We do know that they both also refer to Lady Liberty as the modern Colossus, since both statues were constructed as a symbol of liberation. There's even a plaque placed inside the pedestal of the New York statue, inscribed with the first verse of the sonnet, The New Colossus, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame. To build this massive colossus statue, they sure needed a lot of bronze. Some ancient records even recount that the construction required 27 to 29,000 pounds of bronze. Even for modern times, this is a lot. But back then, they even called it an operation that involved the bronze industry of the entire world. The man tasked with bringing the statue to life was Shars of Lindos, a local Greek sculptor. The whole construction took place from 294 to 282 BCE. But unfortunately, Charles never got to see the end result. We don't know for sure why that happened, but some records claim constructing the Colossus of Rhodes may have led him to complete bankruptcy, since he failed to accurately estimate the cost for the massive statue. Anyway, we still don't know for sure how it was possible to build a statue this big back in those days. They had none of the equipment we have today, like excavators or elevators. Some old records said that they had to invent a completely new, custom method to build it. It all happened on the location, put together piece by piece. They supposedly split the statue into many different sections, and the first one to be constructed was the feet. Once each section was done, huge mounds of earth were placed around it, so they could continue working on the next section above. However, these records were made more than 100 years after the Colossus was finished, so there's little we can say about the accuracy of this information. In all those 12 years, the local Greeks worked around the clock to build the Colossus of Rhodes. They started with a white marble base that they placed at the statue's feet. They then continued with some sort of an iron skeleton to which they attached the bronze plates. 
Why did they choose bronze, though? Well, that was more for practical reasons, since bronze is stronger than iron and it can also sustain extreme weather conditions. More so, if you think about it, the statue was located pretty close to the sea, so the air surrounding it would have been pretty salty. That's why they needed to make it out of quite sturdy material. And what about the location? Well, that's something that has been up for debate for a long time. Researchers initially believed that the statue stood with each leg on either side of the Mandrake Harbor, one of many in the city of Rhodes, basically straddling its entrance. As imposing as that may sound, it was likely not the case. First of all, that would have meant the harbor would have to have been closed for the whole duration of the construction, which doesn't seem to match all the other records. More so, after the statue had fallen, it would have probably blocked the entirety of the harbor, which again doesn't seem to be mentioned anywhere. Most recent depictions say that it most likely stood either on the eastern side of the Mandrake Harbor or maybe even further inland. So, what happened to this impressive structure? Is there really nothing left of it to this day? And why did it survive for only 54 years since it took so long to build and it was so important for locals? Well, as admired and valued as it was to the Greeks, an earthquake took the Colossus of Rhodes away from them. The story goes that because of the movement of the earth beneath it, the statue snapped at its knees and was completely laid on the ground. Nonetheless, the statue still continued to be admired for centuries. The Rhodians refused to rebuild it as they considered it a sign and did not dare intervene with destiny. By the middle of the 7th century, they had taken away what was left of the statue completely. Legend says it took about 900 camels to carry all the bronze away from the location. And what about the looks of the statue? This is also one aspect that is still shrouded in mystery. Even though it was a symbol of the locals' pride in maintaining their independence, they did not use the depiction of the statue for any of the coins they made, even though that was kind of customary. Other art historians do think, however, that the Colossus was similar to other depictions of the same mythological creature, a male figure that had rays of light rising from its head. The position of its hands is also still up for debate. Some say it might have even been holding a torch. We don't know if his hands were pointed straight down or whether the right arm was raised, like in similar representations in Greek mythology. The original might not be here for us to admire anymore, but there are some plans out there to rebuild it. A group of European architects intends to build a 21st century version of the ancient statue. This new construction is planned to stretch 500 feet tall. It should serve as a cultural center combined with a lighthouse. To make sure it won't have the same destiny as its ancient ancestor, these designers intend to use a lot of technology available today. Firstly, they plan to cover the whole exterior of the modern Colossus with solar panels so that the enormous building has enough electricity. They also intend to use modern resources to make sure earthquakes and wind forces won't affect the massive structure yet again. To do that, they plan to build the statue as a tripod structure, made from its two legs and a third pillar of support constructed from the sash draped over the statue's arm and touching the ground. They also planned to place heavy steel support around the base for counterbalance. They even thought of a suspension system that would permit the statue to rock back and forth, making it a bit more flexible and able to resist all the various weather conditions. The manufacturer's suggested retail price on this project is quite high, though, estimated at around 283 million bucks. Supporters of the modern Colossus are optimistic as they are certain they can raise that impressive amount of cash through crowdfunding and private investments. Whenever you hear about ancient ruins, you almost never picture them being suspended somewhere or just randomly hanging on the branch of a tree, right? In fact, for most of the ancient artifacts we have exposed in museums all over the world, archaeologists did quite an impressive amount of digging. You see, buildings have this funny way of fading away over time if not properly taken care of. Sometimes we need to reuse some building materials, so an older construction may be sacrificed in the process. Other times houses are abandoned, 
and once they are exposed to the elements on the surface, like rain or sunlight, they don't really stand a chance. Some just simply crumble away due to good old erosion. So the only way a piece of architecture can survive the test of time is if it's somehow gotten buried deep down. Now, how did they end up buried in the first place? Well, it's quite the comedy of errors. Ancient cities had a habit of gradually raising their ground level like a kid adding toppings to their ice cream sundae. You see, these settlements were always busy collecting food and building materials to keep up with their ever-growing population. But hey, who has time to deal with waste and rubbish? It wasn't exactly high on their to-do list back in the day. So when it came to building new houses, ancient civilizations found it much easier to save their sweat and tears by piling up the rubble and constructing right on top. But that's not all. Rivers would also occasionally flood and deposit a layer of sediment on the city floors, further encapsulating those ancient constructions. And in those dry regions like the desert, where the wind likes to show off its sand and dust dance moves, you can bet it was a constant struggle to keep the establishments clean. One hilarious example is the Sphinx, which had its head buried in sand until a group of archaeologists unearthed it in 1817. Some ancient towns eventually got covered up because they were completely abandoned. With less human activity to control their expansion, plant seeds couldn't resist the opportunity and sprouted all over the place. They gobbled up carbon dioxide from the air and grew, adding more and more bulk to the ground. Those cheeky roots even decided to stabilize the soil made from decaying plant matter, creating layers upon layers of earthy goodness. It's like the ultimate DIY project Mother Nature embarked on, with plants as her loyal helpers. The act of digging into the secrets of ancient civilizations is not just about unearthing a lost world. It's also an epic quest to reveal the hidden treasures beneath layers of history. But how do archaeologists know where to dig in the first place? If everything is covered in layers upon layers of sediments, debris, and plant roots, they must have some sort of system they rely on before embarking on a new project, right? For starters, they're not always the ones suggesting an archaeological dig in a certain location. Let me explain. Let's say you're a contractor and you want to build a new fancy apartment complex in your city. Some local legislations have certain requirements before your project can start though. For instance, before anyone starts building on a piece of land, they might need to bring in specialists to check the soil. These clever folks can be archaeologists, geologists, or paleontologists, and they need to keep an eye on things during development. If any artifacts or eco-facts, fancy word for organic remnants, are discovered, these experts swoop in to excavate and study them. But what about sites that have nothing to do with bulldozers and yellow hats? Archaeologists have more than one trick up their sleeves when it comes to locating ancient hotspots. They dive deep into historic records with a healthy dose of detective work. By sniffing out old documents and maps, they can piece together the puzzle of human activity in a specific area. If a site has been visited before, it's even better. Finding records of past excavations or historical accounts can give archaeologists lots of information on where to continue their treasure hunt. Before archaeologists start swinging their shovels, they engage in a bit of a visual scan mission. Armed with a grid system, they'll stroll around the site, keeping their eyes peeled for any artifacts that might be hiding just beneath the Earth's upper layer. From ground stone tools to historic glass and even ancient garbage dumps, yes, they're also valuable. These keen-eyed explorers can spot signs of human activity faster than most people. If they stumble upon midden soil, fancy term for a garbage dump, they know for sure that humans once called this place home. Archaeologists don't just rely on their trusty shovels, though. They have an arsenal of gadgets to aid in their search for hidden wonders. Geophysical tools are like their secret weapons. Take the resistivity meter, for example. This clever contraption measures the electrical component of the soil and any buried features or artifacts. A buried wall, for instance, will create a different resistivity reading than the surrounding soil. Magnetometers and ground-penetrating radar work in similar ways, showcasing potential hints of ancient treasures in the soil. And who could forget our trusty old friend, the GPS? It helps archaeologists map out precise locations, like a high-tech treasure map, leading them straight to their pot of gold. Care to virtually visit some of the most important archaeological sites in the world? Well, follow me. In the United Kingdom, for instance, you'll find this interesting place called Stonehenge. It's one of many henges scattered around. 
but this one really takes the cake. Picture this. Massive ancient stones standing tall and proud, arranged in a funky outer ring and an inner horseshoe, with some smaller stones thrown in for good measure. And guess what? These amazing stones have been around for over 5,000 years. Talk about a serious case of rock-solid longevity. Now, here's where it gets interesting. According to local folklore, the legendary wizard Merlin whipped out his magic wand and poof! He teleported these massive stones all the way from Ireland. Apparently some giants had assembled them there, but Merlin decided they would look much better at their new location. Others think it's just the ruined remains of an old Roman spiritual edifice. These amazing structures were built by our Bronze Age ancestors. With their simple tools and limited tech, they managed to create this monumental masterpiece. Impressive, right? Unfortunately, there's still so much we don't know about this area. Stonehenge's initial purpose remains a mystery to this day. Sure, there are lots of theories, but scientists have yet to agree on the subject. However, we do know that it's perfectly aligned to catch the sunrise during the summer and winter solstices. The ancient city of Pompeii is an equally amazing archaeological site. Picture this. Mount Vesuvius, a notorious troublemaker, decided to throw a volcanic tantrum and completely covered this ancient Roman city. It turned it into a time capsule, located outside present-day Naples in Italy. Fast forward to the year 1748, when a bunch of adventurous explorers stumbled upon Pompeii. Lo and behold, they discovered a treasure trove of well-preserved goodies, streets, houses, food, probably a bit stale by then, blingy jewelry, fancy sculptures, colorful frescoes, everyday household items, and even animal and human remains. It was like an epic archaeological party. From the looks of it, Pompeii had it all. Fancy houses and villas, a massive 20, 000 seat arena, cute little artisan shops, hangouts like taverns, and let's not forget the saucy spots like those luxurious bathhouses for some intense pampering. There's also the Sanctuary of Apollo, where people used to gather for their daily dose of worship. And of course, the bustling heart of the city, the Forum of Pompeii, where all the cool people used to hang out. And guess what? Pompeii is so cool that it made it to UNESCO's World Heritage List back in 1997. That's like the ultimate Hall of Fame for historical awesomeness. It also includes many other famous buildings and sites, like the Taj Mahal in India and the Acropolis of Athens in Greece. It's 1898, and you're taking part in excavations in Saqqara. This place, not far away from Cairo, is full of ancient tombs and pyramids. You're in your Indiana Jones mood and hope to find something really phenomenal to become famous. Gold, manuscripts, treasure maps, mummies of famous pharaohs. Wait, a wooden bird? You're really disappointed as it looks like a regular toy. An old one, but still. Little do you know that years later, someone would propose that your bird was actually an ancient monoplane. So the artifact, nicknamed the Saqqara bird, is made of a sycamore tree. The birdie has a wingspan of just 7 inches and weighs around 40 grams. A perfect original souvenir from Egypt, I would say. It's over 2,000 years old and looks pretty plain, without any carvings of feathers or other intricate ornaments. It has a beak and eyes, though, which makes our find look like a hawk, the emblem of the deity Horus. Its tail is rather unusual as it's squared, looks weirdly upright, and it seems like the sunken part of it was the place for a now missing piece. Humans love solving a good mystery, so there have been several attempts to explain the use of the birdie. First, quite simply, is that it was a ceremonial object. The second idea is that it was a toy for a child from some well-off family. It could have been some sort of boomerang, which was a popular concept in ancient Egypt. Then there was a theory that the bird had been used as a weather vane. But this one has been debunked as the figure doesn't have any holes or markings except for the one made at the museum in Cairo to fix the exhibit on a stick. So there was no way to hang it in the past. Almost a century after the bird was found, Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Masiha proposed a new theory that it could have been a model of a monoplane. He believed the bird was missing a horizontal tailplane. Otherwise, it had its wings set at a right angle, similar to that of modern planes. 
it could have worked to generate the aerodynamic lift necessary for flights. Dr. Masiha also claimed that it was common at that time to place miniature models of technological inventions in tombs. So, did the ancient Egyptians really invent the plane in 200 BCE? That would make the Wright brothers, who are considered the inventors of aviation, really, really upset. They made one of their first flights only in 1903. There's just one way to know for sure, and that is to test the model. But you know the ancient museum in Cairo would unlikely let one of their cherished exhibits fly around like a toy. That's why glider designer Martin Gregory built a similar model, this time of balsa wood, and concluded that even with the missing tailplane, the plane wasn't much of a flyer. Case solved? Not really. This didn't sound convincing enough to the History Channel, so they invited an aerodynamics expert to build another replica of the bird. He tested it in weather conditions similar to those in Egypt and was impressed with the little plane's abilities. So, if they did invent the prototype of a plane back in the times of pharaohs, it would be a good example of an upart. That's an out-of-place artifact, an object that's way ahead of its time in terms of technology or history. And the Saqqara bird isn't the only example of such a revolutionary concept. In 1901, a group of divers retrieved the Antikythera mechanism from an underwater shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera. It's been dubbed the world's first analog computer, and it's currently dated around 100 BCE. The bronze mechanism could tell the position of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, as well as the lunar phase, the dates of upcoming solar eclipses, and even the speed at which the moon moves through the sky. No one's sure who used it and how or where it was made. But it's obvious that it's extremely precise and way too advanced for its time. The first flushing toilets in the world were invented in the middle of the 20th century. Just kidding. The ancient Minoans on the Mediterranean island of Crete and the Indus Valley civilization both came up with this brilliant invention at the same time, around 4,000 years ago. The plumbing and sanitation were so well done that no one managed to design anything better until 2,000 years later. One ancient Minoan lavatory was discovered at the Palace of Knossos. It looks like it had a wooden seat set over a tunnel that directed water from a rooftop reservoir to an underground sewer. Other varieties got water from jugs. Only the super rich people could afford all this glory. So if you wanted to shop for real estate back then, the flushing toilet would be a telltale sign you were in the rich neighborhood. Automated doors became a cool, seemingly new invention back in 1931. But the technology behind them is actually much older. Think the first century CE old. Mathematician and engineer Heron of Alexandria came up with a hydraulic system to open and close temple doors. To bring it into action, you need to light a fire to produce heat. There was a brass pot under the fire, half filled with water. The inventor connected the brass pot to containers that acted as weights. When the fire was burning, the water moved into the containers. They went down and pulled the ropes. It was nothing like a supermarket door that opens in front of you before you even have time to think. Heron's door took hours to open, and there was no way to stop the process. That's why they only opened the doors once a day before people entered the temple to add some mysticism at the temple during ceremonies. Spooky. Looks like the first ever battery was invented in Baghdad around 2,000 years ago. A German archaeologist found this oval-shaped clay jar in 1938. Scientists are still not sure what purpose it served and who exactly invented it. There is a theory that it was used for electroplating objects with precious metals. When they filled it with a weak acid like vinegar, the battery produced around one volt of electricity. Another theory says it was a vessel for sacred scrolls.
Would you like to buy contact lenses designed by Leonardo da Vinci himself? In 1508, he invented a glass lens with a funnel on one side. You were supposed to wear it with water inside to improve your vision. Sounds a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? So, around a century later, French scientist René Descartes decided to improve the idea and make the cornea contact the future lenses. Contacts because they contact your eyes, get it? The glass tube with liquid did help improve vision, but blinking was sadly impossible. Two and a half centuries later, new technologies in the glass industry let scientists design contacts that would fit in the eye and even let the wearer blink. Thanks, guys! Still, those lenses were made of heavy blown glass and didn't let the eye breathe. About 50 years later, contacts became plastic, lightweight, unbreakable, and scratch resistant, but still covering the entire eye. And then, in 1948, an English optical technician accidentally sanded down a plastic lens and figured out they'd still be in place even if they covered only the cornea. Imagine you're living in 19th century London and need to send a message to New York. It would have taken about 10 days to get there by ship. So when delivery time went from days to hours in 1858, it was a true sensation. The first message was sent by Queen Victoria herself. It was all made possible thanks to the transatlantic telegraph cable running under the ocean. Sadly, the new cool invention only lasted a few weeks. It took years to bring it back to life. You know, scientists make discoveries that change the world, but even they can face mysteries. Here are 10 things that have baffled scientists. Imagine that you constantly hear a low-frequency hum, and no one can trace its source. Roughly 4% of the world's population hears the hum. It's a geography-free sound. I mean, people all around the world hear it. So the name varies from Taos hum to Auckland hum depending on the region where it gets generated. The sound is just on the threshold of human hearing. People hear it less when they're outside, and it gets louder indoors, especially at night. What's even scarier is that you cannot unhear it once you've heard it. Some folks say it started in London around the time of Charles Dickens, who wrote A Christmas Carol, and the low-frequency sound actually comes from the humbug. <laughs> or not. Actually, the earliest cases were recorded in Bristol, UK, dating back to the mid-1970s. Scientists have various theories about where the hum comes from and why only some people can hear it. Yet they don't have a clear answer. It could occur when ocean waves move along the ocean floor. They shake the Earth when they collide with continental shelves. Or this might be happening because of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. Oh, and how about ultra-low frequency radio signals used to communicate with submarines or even 5G? Hmm. Upsweep is another type of unidentified sound. It was discovered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. The sound is high enough to be recorded throughout the ocean. Scientists theorize that the sound could be related to underwater volcanic activity. Interestingly, the volume of the sound has been diminishing compared to its volume when it was first discovered, yet it still can be detected. Plus, it's seasonal. It reaches its highest volume in spring and fall. Is it related to seasonal changes? No one really knows for sure. The next mysterious thing is a cone-shaped monument found in the Sea of Galilee in Israel. This monument was discovered accidentally by sonar scanning in 2003. But the findings were published only in 2013. The monument weighs 60,000 tons. It was once submerged by rising waters. Archaeologists say the monument is enigmatic because they can't figure out where it's from. They don't know what it's connected to or its function. So this big and unusual thing remains a mystery. Now let's move to Gobekli Tepe, Turkey. This place offers you one of the most archaeologically significant sites in the world. Why is it important? Well, it has massive carved stones about 11,000 years old. To put it in perspective, they're 6,000 years older than Stonehenge. Ancient people placed these stones before they began farming or crafting metal tools or pottery. So the existence of this place goes against the chronology of civilization we're familiar with, where people farmed first and built second. 
Apparently, it wasn't like that. In any case, a good question is, what was the purpose of this site? Was it built to worship some spirits? Yep, archaeologists believe it might be the world's oldest temple. Okay, say this with me. Paleodiction notosum. Yeah, I know, it sounds like a chemical formula. This is a living fossil found deep down on the ocean floor. A creature makes these hexagonal burrows, that for sure. Yet scientists can't identify the artist. Now, what do I mean by living fossil? Well, Paleodiction notosum is a creature believed to produce a burrow nearly identical to Paleodiction fossils. Is it a worm-like animal that made them? Scientists don't know. One thing is clear. This isn't some random stuff created by geological forces. Now, speaking of fossils, take a look at this giant one. Its informal name is Godzillius. It was discovered in 2011 by an amateur paleontologist. This is a scientist who studies the history of life on Earth by analyzing fossil records. Anyway, back to Godzillius. It's almost 7 feet in length and 9 feet tall if you were to measure it upright. This fossil is 450 million years old, coming from the time when Cincinnati was underwater. It might be a fossilized algae mat, but some scientists have different opinions. This is a massive tunnel found in South America. The tunnel is at least 8,000 to 10,000 years old. At first, researchers discovered a couple of colossal burrows. They were enormous and neatly constructed. Geologists were amazed, saying they had never seen such structures before. There's no known geologic process to explain their formation. I mean, researchers have known about the burrows since the 1930s. But back then, they believed that these tunnels were just some sort of archaeological construction. Until they discovered huge claw marks on the walls and ceiling. They reasoned that some extinct species could be the ones to have left these marks. Many geologists strongly believe they found the burrows of giant ground sloths and armadillos. The structure is the largest known burrow from the Paleolithic age in the Amazon. Yet experts have many questions. How come such a deliberate-looking structure could form naturally? A researcher then discovered another strange cave. This one was hundreds of miles away from the massive tunnel. Fast forward, there are now more than 1,500 burrows from the Paleolithic Age found in Brazil. What's even more interesting is that some of these caves are connected to tunnels that sometimes lead to chambers. I'll continue with a natural phenomenon. What if I told you that every year, especially in October, fireballs appear on the Mekong River in Thailand? According to legends, Naga fireballs are a call for Buddha to return to Earth. And river serpents are the ones making these calls. Well, that's a myth. But what does science say about it? Is it related to a flammable gas? There are no clear answers yet. These fireballs appear to rise from the water. They can go as high as almost 990 feet. They're like fireworks, disappearing rapidly. They typically glow with a reddish or orange color. I'll mention some legends too, because why not? They're thrilling. And it would be a shame not to include the one about the lost city of Atlantis. As you may know, the legend says that Atlantis submerged into the ocean around 11,000 years ago. Since then, not just scientists, but also treasure hunters and philosophers have been searching for the lost world. Could Bimini Road be a trace? In 1968, a diver found strange stones off the coast of North Bimini Island in the Bahamas. The stones look human-made. It's like they were evenly spaced out and laid in an orderly row. It baffled scientists, but not for long. Carbon dating analysis of the blocks revealed that geological forces created the road naturally. There weren't any tool marks or signs indicating that the blocks had been stacked or something. The research is continuing, but yeah, scientists generally believe that the rocks were created by erosion. Well, I guess the time of Atlantis hasn't come yet. Okay, picture this. You're wandering on the beach, and you see dozens of octopuses walking past. In 2017, a group of people from Wales witnessed exactly this. Why did these creatures come out of the ocean? No one knows the answer. The group reported that they had seen 20 to 30 octopi crawling on the sand. The people looked for some signs of injury, but found nothing. They said that they had carried the animals back to the ocean. 
Interestingly, these creatures kept crawling onto the shore when people were asleep. Experts say that it's hard to be sure of the reason that pushed the animals to the beach without conducting a physical examination. They're still speculating about the reason behind this unusual and rare occurrence. Could it be overcrowding? Furthermore, the octopi were (laughs) well-armed. A separate study points out that the more fishers hunt large animals that feed on octopuses, the more the octopus population grows. Maybe that's why these creatures have to go farther to find food or shelter. But without proper research, these are only theories. There's a lot we don't know about space, too. So here's a bonus fact about the yellowish source of life in the solar system. Scientists have discovered a new type of wave inside the sun. These waves move in the opposite direction to the sun's rotation. Plus, they move super fast. So fast that it's beyond our understanding. Researchers have different theories about the function of the waves. If they figure out their role, this could give them additional insight into the processes happening inside the sun. And yes, the octopi were (laughs) well-armed. A comfortable abode with a gorgeous view of the Mediterranean Sea will serve as a perfect rain shelter. Well, this is what a real estate advertisement might have looked like for Neanderthals 100,000 years ago. Welcome to the weird and wonderful caves you could live in. Or not. Of course, back then, neither real estate and advertising had been invented yet. Never mind the fact that Neanderthals couldn't build houses and often lived in caves. Yet, one of those caves looks an awful lot like a residential building. It's situated inside a high limestone cape called the Rock of Gibraltar. If the Neanderthals had had an economy, the caves inside this rock would have cost a bundle. Navigators discovered it in 1907. They just spotted a big hole inside the fortified rock. For many years, scientists have studied this place and found some traces of Neanderthals. They discovered ancient tools in the cave and bones of old animals. But the coolest thing was, they found four caves inside the rock. It was like a residential complex. Neanderthals lived alongside neighbors and helped each other hunt and fish. They created feather decorations and painted abstract drawings on the walls. Imagine our ancient predecessors hanging out in these caves 100,000 years ago. And now, scientists hang out there and study the primeval past of Neanderthals in detail. At the end of 2021, archaeologists uncovered a gap inside one of the caves leading to an unknown tunnel. They crawled through this hole and opened a new space under the cave roof. This place has been closed off from the outside world for over 40,000 years. And it seems it was one of the most prestigious apartments in the entire mountain complex. It has high ceilings with ancient stalactites. The ruined stone curtains divided the apartment into several rooms. Scientists also found the remains of ancient animals and scratches on the walls. It seems that Neanderthals had never lived here, but they used to visit this place. Archaeologists found the shell of a sea snail called dog whelk. One of the Neanderthals brought it here for some reason. But the primary owners of this place were hyenas. These caves show that Neanderthals were closer to humans than to monkeys. They had a way of life and even some customs. There's still a lot of work ahead, and scientists hope to find new rooms inside this rock. Meanwhile, in 2003, archaeologists discovered another early dwelling on the Isle of Flores in Indonesia. Among the green jungle, they found a cave with ancient tools. At first, everyone thought the human ancestors lived here. But then, scientists discovered an unusual skeleton of an adult. A thorough analysis showed the skeleton belonged to a 30-year-old woman, three and a half feet tall, just above the waist of an average adult. The woman's weight was equal to the weight of an adult shepherd. The skeleton didn't belong to Neanderthals or Australopithecines. It was a new unknown species, which scientists called Homo floresiensis, or simply the hobbit. Also, there were remains of unusual ancient animals in the cave. It was an elephant the size of a cow, some large storks, and giant rats. Archaeologists have found out that hobbits were not the owners of this place. The main inhabitants were the rats the size of a cat. Maybe they were fighting the hobbits. Some analysis shows that Homo florensiensis wasn't our direct ancestor. They were in a separate branch of evolution. The hobbit skeleton looks more like that of a monkey than of modern humans. 
In 2009, in the dense jungle of Vietnam, archaeologists discovered San Don, the largest cave in the world. If you go inside the cave and shout, you'll hear your echo a long time. In some places, the height of this cave reaches half the height of the Empire State Building. And the total area is larger than one central block of New York. Sun Don is one of the three caves in the Vietnamese jungle. Many intricate mazes connect these caves. Inside, you can find unique plants and trees that live separately from the outside world. It's a real underground jungle. In some places, you can find collapsed ceilings that let the sunlight in. Besides unusual trees and plants, ancient stalactites hang there. Some limestone deposits are more than 450 million years old. They were here even before dinosaurs appeared. There are also many rivers in the cave. Rainwater coming down from holes in the ceiling has formed them. Fast streams resemble slides in a water park. They lead to unknown underground labyrinths. Scientists have studied only a small part of all these caves. The next unusual cave is in New Zealand. Hundreds of thousands of fireflies live inside. Each of them glows with a blue light. Together, they light up the cave. It may seem to you that you're on another planet, but you can't stay there for a long time. Special air measuring devices are everywhere. Scientists monitor the level of carbon dioxide necessary for the normal existence of fireflies. These insects are sensitive to the environment. If there are many people in the cave, or they stay there too long, the park staff will ask them to leave the place. It's like you're literally stealing oxygen from the fireflies. We've seen some pretty amazing caves so far, but how about a scary one? We're going to the desert of Yemen's Almara province. What we're looking for is not a cave. It's just a black hole in the ground, right in the middle of the desert. It's big, the size of a basketball court. It's not its size that can scare you, but what's inside. Scientists are still not sure what it is. From the depths of this black abyss, a disgusting smell of rotten eggs constantly comes out. And sometimes, you can hear some strange, frightening sounds. The blackness of the giant hole in Yemen absorbs all the sun's rays, so you won't see what's there even with a powerful flashlight. People flew over this place by helicopter. They filmed using drones and the most powerful lenses, but they didn't catch anything except darkness. It looks like a big ink spot in the middle of golden sand. The locals are afraid to approach this place. They believe the cave leads to another dimension where evil creatures live. At the moment, the giant hole in Yemen is one of the most poorly studied and mysterious phenomenon of nature. How did it appear? How old is it? Where does it lead? Scientists are trying to find the answers to these questions. There are theories that the hole appeared because of construction work. Geologists drilled the soil nearby in search of minerals. It could have caused fluctuations in the Earth's crust and collapsed the surface. But no one can prove this theory. Yet. And now, imagine a place where sunlight has not penetrated for more than 5 million years. There's little oxygen, and it's cold and damp. Still, life is born in this place. Not only microbes and bacteria, but also something bigger. The living conditions in this cave are very different from the usual ones. So, in a sense, this cave is like another planet. It's the Movil Cave in the southeast of Romania, near the Black Sea. The entrance is a small hole in the ground. Inside, a tunnel leads deep below the surface. The levels of hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide are above normal inside the cave. The air here is half as much oxygen as on the surface. People can't be here without an oxygen mask. But other creatures living here can. The cave is home to 48 species of living organisms. 33 of them are unknown. Here, you can meet some unusual insects. White snails and white spiders, millipedes with huge whiskers, transparent shrimp, and unique species of leeches. They all live here thanks to the little bacteria autotrophs. They absorb carbon dioxide and release food particles. Bacteria feed on it. Other larger organisms feed on these bacteria, and some bigger organisms eat those little ones. In the end, everyone gets food. In this cave, evolution has created a biological system separate from the rest of the world. Everyone loves a good landmark. The Roman Colosseum, the ancient city of Machu Picchu, the Giza Pyramids, 
But have you ever wondered how it once looked? Way back in the days when they were built? Or even in the time they were covered in ivy and forgotten by humanity? Buckle up, because we're heading on a time travel adventure to the world's greatest archaeological sites. Our voyage begins in South America, deep inside the Peruvian mountains. Behold, the city of Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is a monument to the ingenuity and power of the Inca civilization. During its prime, the Inca civilization stretched 2,500 miles along South America's coastline from modern-day Ecuador all the way down to Chile. And Machu Picchu was located at the heart and center of it. The historic site was constructed at around 7,000 feet above sea level, more or less around 1450 BCE. The gated city consisted of around 150 buildings made of stone. The Incas managed to build temples, houses, and even a complex aqueduct system to irrigate the entire town. And yes, they did all that without the help of wheels or any instrument made of iron. The housing model is somewhat similar to stone houses we see nowadays, with the difference that the Incas didn't use any cement to stick together the blocks of stone. Yet, they fit seamlessly on top of each other. Not only that, the Incas must have developed a rudimentary yet effective anti-earthquake technology, since in the event of a quake, the rocks would shake without falling out of place. If Machu Picchu had been built today, it would have cost over $70 million to finish the entire thing. The purpose of the site is still a mystery to many historians. Theories suggest that it could have been built as a ceremonial site, a safety base for the Inca people, or even a retreat for royalty. What we know for a fact is that in the 16th century, 100 years after Machu Picchu was built, its population abandoned it, with tree roots taking over the majority of the site and keeping it hidden from humankind for over four centuries. It wasn't until the 20th century that the world was reintroduced to Machu Picchu when a Peruvian farmer led Yale University professor Hiram Bingham III to visit the site. Since then, Bingham and many other explorers dedicated their lives and research to studying the archaeological wonder of Machu Picchu. Now, for the next stop on our time-traveling vehicle, the city of Pompeii in Italy. Pompeii has crowded our collective imagination for many years. The eruption of the Mount Vesuvius volcano in 79 AD and the destruction of an entire city is hopefully not something that will happen again. But I bet you're wondering, what did Pompeii look like on its last day? It took 18 hours for Pompeii's streets, markets, houses, and forums to be buried under millions of tons of volcanic ash. Thanks to some clever scientists, we discovered that the lava and ashes that covered Pompeii on its very last day actually helped to freeze the city in time. Different from ice, the cloud of ashes did not preserve the city intact. But as the items disintegrated over 2,000 years, they left voids under the earth. Archaeologists found that if they filled these voids with plaster, the shape of the buried city would soon reveal itself. And that's exactly what happened. Of course, it was nothing like the bustling city of 12,000 people that had existed for many years before the fateful eruption. Pompeii was a vibrant and rich municipality. The site's ruins revealed that many areas of Pompeii boasted impressive houses, some with balconies, which was a sign of great wealth at the time. And believe it or not, even some artwork survived the eruption. Archaeologists found well-preserved frescoes and murals of mythological creatures, all indicating that members of the high society lived there. Ruins show the city even had thermal baths and showers made with luxurious materials. Oh, and apparently, the people of Pompeii had amazing teeth. Yes, archaeologists could see even that tiny level of detail from the plaster molds they recovered from underground. Still in the Italian territory, we find one of the world's biggest tourist attractions, the Roman Colosseum. It was built as an amphitheater during the reign of Emperor Vespasian, around 70 AD. It wasn't until 80 AD that Vespasian's son, Emperor Titus, inaugurated the Colosseum. The monument was something to behold, with 157-foot-tall walls, over 80 entrances, and the capacity to host 87,000 people. All social classes and groups were welcome at the Colosseum, and this partly explains why it flourished for so many centuries. During the decline of the Roman Empire, around the 6th century AD, 
The Colosseum started being neglected and abandoned. The monument was looted, and some of its columns and stones were used to build infrastructure elsewhere. Only one third of the original Colosseum still remains. And if it's big now, imagine what it once was. Greece was home to one of the world's largest empires. At the height of this empire, literally and historically speaking, more or less 2400 years ago, the Greeks built a citadel known as the Acropolis. The Acropolis, which is composed of historical buildings, is considered to be one of the biggest landmarks of Western civilization to date. Tourists that visit the capital city of Athens today may be faced with yellowish and broken pillars of the Parthenon standing way up high in one of the city's hills. But way back when it was built, between 447 and 432 BCE, the imposing and majestic Parthenon was purely white as the entire monument was built with gleaming white marble. The statues inside were made of gold. The Parthenon is a 23,000 square foot temple held up by 69 marble columns. The largest blocks of marble are massive, weighing around 10 tons each. And the most surprising fact is that the marble didn't come from Athens, but from a nearby site that stood 10 miles from the Acropolis known as Mount Pentelikon. Historians intrigued by where the primary material for building the Acropolis came from found tiny and big blocks of marble all scattered around the floor of Mount Pentelikon. There was also a paved road that the Greeks had built to carry the rocks around. But perhaps the most impacting monument of all times is located at the heart of the Middle East, outside the Egyptian city of Cairo. The pyramids are considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Giza Pyramid Complex was built as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu around 4,500 years ago. Between 20 to 30,000 people took part in the construction process. It's composed of three pyramids. The massive monument is made out of approximately 8,000 tons of granite and over 550,000 tons of mortar, which gives it the appearance it has today. Would you believe me if I told you that the pyramids didn't always look like this? Far from it. They were shiny white with a golden triangular tip at the top. This is because the Egyptians used over 6 million tons of limestone to cover the entire rocky, step-like structure. All so that they could gleam white under the unforgiving sunlight of Egyptian skies. The Pyramid of Khufu remained the tallest structure on Earth made by humans for over 3,800 years. It was the only eight-sided pyramid in Egypt and was believed to align with Orion's belt. It's considered to be the most aligned construction facing north. In 1979, it was inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Let's head on down to the Indian city of Agra to quickly visit the Taj Mahal. You may know it as the Taj, but it can also be called by its more endearing name, a teardrop in the cheek of time. The Taj took over 22 years to build and was commissioned in 1632 by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan as a declaration of love for his third and favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. It was made with ivory white marble and amazingly, due to tight conservation, it still remains very similar to what it was when it was built. I think all this talk of landmarks got me thirsty for some traveling. What about you? Tell us in the comments below if you've ever visited some of these sites or which interesting landmarks you'd add to this video. Imagine you could spend an entire week scanning ancient ruins and taking photographs of the world's most surreal archaeological sites. Would you be up for it? So, let's do some digging. The first stop on your busy itinerary is Southeast Asia. It's home to some pretty cool ruins. You start in Bagan, located in the hinterlands of Myanmar. There are many ways to visit the site, and you're glad you've booked two different experiences. The first one is a hot air balloon trip at sunrise. Right before dawn, you board the balloon, and as soon as the sun starts to appear on the horizon, you begin your flight over the marvelous area. As the sun rises, it glistens on more than 2,000 conic-shaped golden structures. The hot air balloon ride is quick, but it gives you unparalleled views of all the 40 miles over which the site sprawls. Back on land, you rent a bicycle and roam the village of ruins. 
Some of them are open and allow you to peep inside. These magnificent ruins were built between the 11th and 13th century CE and were mainly places of worship. There were originally over 10,000 buildings, but they were gradually deteriorating over time due to earthquakes. Thankfully, the site became a UNESCO World Heritage Site back in 2015 and has since been preserved. Up next, you catch a flight to Cambodia. You take some time to visit Angkor. The world-famous archaeological site nestled deep within the jungle. Good thing you've brought bug spray with you. The city of Angkor was once the capital of the Khmer Empire from the 9th to 15th century. FYI, the word Angkor means capital city in the Khmer language. The city was founded by King Yasavarman I, and it became one of the largest cities in the pre-industrial world. Researchers say nearly one million people live there. Until today, Angkor is admired for its stunning architecture. The Khmer style is recognized in the use of huge blocks of sandstone. The towers are believed to have been once decorated with gold. But today, the site is a maze of vine-covered temples. The city was abandoned in 1431 and wasn't rediscovered until the 1840s. Oh, and just so you know, this is also a UNESCO heritage site. It became one in 1992. In case you want to brag to your friends about your culturally rich adventures in the future. Now, your trip continues in Egypt. You're here to visit the Karnak Temple in the city of Luxor. You opt for the most unusual way to get to Luxor. That is, a boat ride down the Nile River. Leaving Cairo, you head south until you reach the famous ancient city. Luxor was once the capital of Egypt and a true hub of power and wealth. That is why the Karnak complex is such a great archaeological site. You choose to visit it at night, and still at the entrance, you are struck by the site's beauty. In the evening, artificial lights cast a golden glow on the temple statues and stone columns. The temple is huge and was built mainly around the 18th and 19th centuries BCE. Each Egyptian pharaoh from that period left their own architectural mark on the site. The highlight of this tour is taking a walk through the Avenue of Sphinxes and discovering the Great Hypostyle Hall. This hall is filled with towering pylons and solid sandstone columns, a true wonder. From Egypt, you head down to Jordan. Now, if you like terracotta landscapes, you've come to the right place. The city of Petra is a marvel of the ancient world. Located in Jordan's desert, the city was a commercial hub back in the 4th century BCE. The Nabataeans, an Arab Bedouin tribe, lived in the so-called Rose City and thrived for many years, having accumulated a significant amount of wealth. The city was known for its innovative water management system, which made the region inhabitable. And yes, you'll catch a glimpse of its ruins on your tour. The rock-carved, gate-like structure Petra is famous for what is called the Pharaoh's Treasury. It stands at the main entrance to the site and is said to have a treasure hidden beneath it. Don't forget to stand right beneath it and take one of those classic pictures for social media. Once Petra has been ticked off the list, you fly to Southern Europe. More specifically, to the tip of the Italian boot. You have a day trip scheduled to visit the ruins of Pompeii. Pompeii can be reached by car from the city of Naples. It's home to the eerie yet well-preserved ruins of a city that was once engulfed by lava. When Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 CE, it left the city of Pompeii completely buried under millions of tons of volcanic ash. The ancient city was first discovered by beneath the volcanic rock in the 16th century but it was first cleared from debris in the 1870s. Today, you'll be able to walk down the streets of these ancient Roman ruins and imagine what the town looked like in its heyday. Pompeii was a vibrant and rich municipality. The site's ruins revealed that many areas of Pompeii had boasted impressive bakeries, markets, and even houses with balconies, which were a sign of great wealth at the time. And believe it or not, even some artworks survived the eruption. Archaeologists found well-preserved frescoes in murals with mythological creatures. All this indicates that members of the high society lived there. The city even had thermal baths and showers made from luxurious materials. 
While you're still in Europe, you'll hop over to visit the iconic Stonehenge. It's a perfect day trip if you stay in the city of London, just a short train journey away. Stonehenge dots the Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England, and is one of the world's most recognized ancient ruins. More than 5,000 years old, these curious stone rings are some of the oldest stone structures on the planet. Created out of sandstone, they are shrouded in misery. Who built them and why is still largely unknown. Popular theories claim that Stonehenge was used as a great solar calendar, built to help people keep track of days, weeks, and months. Hmm, talk about hard work to create a mere calendar, huh? In the final leg of your trip will take you to explore the Southern Americas. In Guatemala, in Central America, you'll find ancient Mayan ruins. The lost city of Tikal is a city made of 3,000 buildings, the remains of the capital of the Mayan Empire. You can compare its importance to such cities as London or New York today. The North Acropolis is Tikal's most ancient complex of monuments. Built solely by human hands in 350 BCE, it served as the resting place of kings and chiefs. Back in the day, the steppe pyramid temples were painted a beautiful red. Mayans loved that color. Today, of course, you'll only see the limestone. You might wonder what made such a great city turn into ruins. Well, archaeologists have no clue about the cause of Tikal's decline until today. This question remains unanswered. Was it a drought? Disease? Maybe we'll never know. Are you in the mood for some Mayan ruins? Chichen Itza is an archaeological site with the best preserved pyramids on Earth. Located in Mexico's Yucatan state, this Mayan city is well over 1,500 years old. At its peak, it was home to 35,000 people. The site covers 1.9 square miles and has many ruins spread throughout it. The highlight is El Castilla, a tremendous steppe temple rising 80 feet above the ground. Its most peculiar feature is that it has 91 steps on each of its four sides, including the upper platform, which makes for 365 steps, the same as the number of days in the solar year. Phew, what an intense trip. Time to head home now and soak it all in. See you next time. The unanswered mystery surrounding ancient civilizations have been a source of inspiration for many conspiracy theorists. In fact, some of these mysteries are so interesting that many of us either already believe them or would like to. One thing is for sure though, none of those thousands of conspiracy theories have ever been… hmm, what's the word? Oh yeah, classified. Or have they? We're all aware that the CIA has done some questionable things throughout history for the sake of national security. But you wouldn't expect a book to be both a national and international threat. The CIA recently declassified parts of a book that talks about lost ancient civilizations and the catastrophic events that made them vanish thousands of years ago. This mysterious book was written in 1963 by a guy named Chan Thomas, and it was going to be published by Emerson House in 1965 until the CIA got involved. For some mysterious reason, they classified the book, and it was never released to the public until recently. But here's where it gets interesting. The book was declassified in 2013 due to the Freedom of Information Act, but it wasn't released to the public until 2016. And what was released truly raises a few questions. The original version of this document was 284 pages long. But the PDF essay that was released was heavily censored, with just 57 pages, which makes it one-fifth of the whole document. The pages were edited before they were released to the public in such a way that you wouldn't even notice that the other pages were missing. Now, no one really knows why this book was classified in the first place, but it has some interesting content from what I've gathered. The author of the book had quite the imagination and a huge love for ancient civilizations. And even though what he had to say is very thought-provoking, some of it is just bizarre. He believes that our planet is locked into a never-ending cycle of pole shifts and Earth-crust displacements that are responsible for the mass extinctions of many civilizations which existed more than 6,000 years ago, even before the Sumerians. 
He believed that these events caused more damage to the Earth than meteors. And he bases this theory on a few artifacts that exist around the world, but weren't really noticed until recently. But I'll get into that in a bit. Those mass extinctions that the book talks about include the end of the Ice Age, when huge, two-mile-thick ice sheets disappeared from northern Europe, northern America, and Canada, and caused 100 species to go extinct. And here's how the author illustrates his hypothesis. He believes that there was a geomagnetic pole shift which caused catastrophic changes to both the atmosphere and the Earth's crust, resulting in the extinction of many civilizations over time. Now, even though the geomagnetic pole shift is a real thing, it doesn't just happen overnight. It happens really slowly. Only about every few hundred thousand years, according to scientists. But it's a bit more complicated than it sounds. It is a well-known fact that the North Pole is somewhere above Alaska, and the South Pole is close to the middle of Antarctica. Now, these are the geographic poles, and they'll always be north and south. However, the Earth's magnetic poles flipped a few hundred thousand years ago. So if you had a compass, let's say 700,000 years ago, it would instead point south and show you the Antarctic. But the author of the book has a different theory. He believed that the flip of the north and south magnetic poles doesn't happen every few hundred thousand years, but every 12,000 years. And that this flip occurs in just a few hours, causing a catastrophic apocalypse. He thinks this happens as a result of an explosion inside the Earth's core. This explosion causes the magnetic poles to flip, but it also causes the Earth's crust to move. According to the book, due to these catastrophic events, a lot of the Earth's continents that were submerged underwater rose above sea level in just a few hours. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The author also states that the Peruvian Andes were beneath the ocean before the last pole shift. And even though it seems far-fetched, since the Andes are approximately 22,000 feet above sea level, there was evidence to support that claim in the late 80s. Scientists found whale bones and fossils that are said to be millions of years old on top of the Andes and the Himalayan mountains. It's also suggested in the book that the deep freeze the Earth went through during the Younger Dryas event caused the Gulf Stream to be disrupted. And he points to some interesting evidence to support that theory. Frozen mammoths were found trapped in blocks of ice with food still in their mouths. Now, this is a true mystery, because freezing cold weather is in their nature, and they were among the few animals that could truly survive in the Ice Age. So, what could have caused them to freeze so quickly? Kinda makes you go, hmm, doesn't it? The document describes the Great Pyramid of Giza as a true enigma as well. The Pyramid of Giza is made out of 2.5 million stone blocks that are placed on top of each other with great precision. It's close to 750 feet wide and more than 450 feet high. To this day, we're still not able to explain how it was constructed, and it's quite difficult to understand the internal design as well. On the inside, the pyramid has no similarities to the other pyramids, and, despite popular belief, there were no mummies found in any of them. If you think that's a bit weird, wait for the next one. There are absolutely no hieroglyphs found in any of the pyramids, and that goes both ways. <laughs> what do I mean? There are also no pyramids, or anything that resembles a pyramid, in any hieroglyphs either. Mr. Thomas believes that the pyramids were created hundreds of thousands of years before the Egyptians by a civilization that went extinct. Speaking of civilizations, in his book, he even mentions the Greeks. He claims that in Greece, there was another ancient race of people that went extinct as well. He claims they were extremely tall with blue eyes and blonde hair and had access to advanced technology that the Greeks couldn't have known about in their prime. Now, before we drift too far away from the stone blocks, let's talk about another mystery, the temple in Baalbek, Lebanon, and its ginormous foundation blocks. Those stones, which make up the Heliopolis, were also used for the temple in Rome. The foundations of the temples are made of 900-ton trilithon stones, and according to the author, this is proof that there must have been a lost ancient civilization with advanced technology. Now, most archaeologists claim that those stones were made by the Romans, 
However, there's no evidence to support that. The Romans didn't have the technological equipment to make the stones or lift them. So, you might think, what if they just made them in that place right then and there? Well, those stones were also lifted 30 feet high and were placed next to each other with mathematical precision. And let's not forget about the blocks on top of the Heliopolis in Lebanon, which weigh about 800 tons each. But wait till you hear the next one. The Romans don't even credit themselves for these stones. They claim that they build up the sides, but they don't take credit for the extraordinarily large and heavy foundation stones. The author also makes an interesting point about the distance between the Roman capital and Baalbek in Lebanon. Why would the Romans build the world's largest monolithic stones in such a remote area, and so far away from their capital, and never take credit for it? Well, folks, it's a mystery to me. Now, let's move on to the most intriguing enigma. Easter Island, which is located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, or nowhere if you will. The author questions how people found it or even settled in such a remote island that long ago. One of the signifiers of Easter Island are the Moai statues and the mystery surrounding who they depict and why. What's an even bigger question is how they were created, moved, and positioned in the places they were found. According to this declassified document, Easter Island was part of the now lost continent named Mu, and it was sunk in the Pacific Ocean in a disastrous cataclysm that happened during one of those pole shifts. The continent of Mu, according to the book, was as big as South America, and what we now call Easter Island is just what's left of that continent. The author also believes that this is what happened with the lost city of Atlantis as well. Plato is even quoted about this, saying that the whole city of Atlantis sunk miles beneath the waves within just a day. Even though the whole story sounds very intriguing and makes some interesting points, we know that, scientifically speaking, a cataclysmic pole shift causing entire civilizations to go extinct isn't possible. Okay, here's a quick pop quiz on geography and touristy stuff. What's the biggest city in Italy? Hmm, did you say Rome? Then you got it right. Rome has a population of over 2 million people. And what would you say is the current population of Venice? Well, that's a tricky one to know by heart. But to answer correctly, in 2022, it was a little over 258,000 people. Now, what if I told you that for 80% of them, the Venice they live in isn't the tourist and historical one with all the canals. It's rather the other side of town. If you know someone who's traveled to Venice before, they may have sent you a postcard with an image of a gondola in a canal. I bet you never imagined that Venice could also just look like this, just a regular old Italian city. As tourists, we have a strong misconception about what Venice is. We think the real Venice is what we see in the movies. Well, I hate to be the one to pop your illusion, but there's more to Venice than straight canals and old bridges. Here are the boundaries of the real Venice. Probably the postcards you get only picture this bit of the city called Centro Storico, or Historical Center. But the city also includes the mainland, called Terra Firma, where most Venetians live today. The interesting thing to look at is how the number of people living in the historical center has decreased over the years. From then on, the number started to reduce more with each passing year. Today, only 50,000 people can afford to live there. To understand that, let's travel back in time for a moment. Before Venice became an important Italian city, it was nothing but a fisherman's village. It was only around the 5th century that people decided to take a chance and build on the marshy ground of the Venetian islands. If you've ever wondered how Venice holds up, let's just say it's due to strong blocks of wood driven deep into the ground. As it turns out, you need oxygen and water to ruin wood, and in marshy soils, there isn't much oxygen, so the buildings were safe. It was during the Middle Ages that Venice became one of the world's most important maritime empires. You might remember that's where Marco Polo, the famous merchant and explorer, came from. The city was extremely well located, right in the Adriatic Sea, and had access to huge commercial empires of the time, like the city of Constantinople. At that time, the most prestigious jobs you can get were like the ones Marco Polo had, anything related to long-distance trading. Since then, Venice consists of 118 islands, and some say there are around 400 bridges in the city. 
Quick question here. Can you name at least two of the most famous Venetian islands? Let's start with Burano. The island of Burano is famous for its lace-making and its super colorful landscape. FYI, Burano is also home to a less famous leaning tower than the one in Pisa. It's called the Tower of Burano. And then there's the island of Murano. They are famous for their products of fine glass. You can find anything from huge vases to water glasses, jewelry, and so on. They're quite exquisite, but also super expensive. But you know what they say, time changes everything. In the 20th century, Venice was no longer the trading hub it once was. Its economic power was failing seriously. So the city decided to invest in something else, its historical value. And the best way they found how to do that was through preservation. Let's face it, if you're a tourist who enjoys history, you would jump at the opportunity of visiting a UNESCO heritage site, wouldn't you? Initially, this was rather good for the city. But the thing is, as tourism in Venice skyrocketed, the old dynamics of the city started to change to keep up with the intense tourism. Truth is, in our day and age, lots of tourists rather buy small and cheap souvenirs than invest their money in expensive manufactured goods, such as the classic Murano glasses. The traditional Venetian stores that were open hundreds of years ago just didn't have the economic power to compete with new stores that opened to cater specifically for tourists. And then, what happened next is something we often call falling down the rabbit hole. Because, as it turned out, tourists attracted more tourists, and Venice lost control over it. The maximum sustainable number of tourists in Venice would be around 22,500 people per day. But in 2021, Venice saw up to 80,000 tourists per day in certain parts of the year. If you remember that there are only 50,000 people living in Venice's historical center nowadays, that almost means that tourists outnumber locals by 2 to 1. This is what gave Venice one of its current nicknames amongst the locals, which is a short-term city. I mean, if you live in a touristy city such as New York City or Paris, you'd be sure to avoid the parts of the city that are more touristy. But in Venice, that's difficult, since we're talking about several small islands. Whether you want it or not, the city is constantly packed. Locals started to complain that things such as getting a table at a restaurant or crossing an important square, such as Piazza San Marco, would take hours. Not to mention that instead of normal car traffic, well, in Venice, you can experience some gondola traffic. But that's not even the worst that's been happening. As the number of tourists per year started to rise exponentially, so did the infrastructure to accommodate all these people. When landlords understood that they could make more money off of tourists than they could with locals, overall prices started to soar. That's why, from the 1950s onward, fewer Venetians were able to continue living in the city's historical center. Landlords decided to more than double the prices of housing. So, a family that paid around 800 euros for their apartment now had to pay something around 1,500 euros to stay in the same place. And social services couldn't even do anything about it, because there were so many similar cases happening all over the historical center. This may sound like something small, but when you stop to look at the big picture, it's changing the social fabric of the city. Yep, that's what usually happens in super touristy places. France is having to deal with a similar problem of over-tourism. France's Ministry of Tourism has concluded that tourists are spending less money, yet over-exploiting the classic tourist landmarks. Cities are made up of much more than just buildings and infrastructure. As urban sociologist Georg Simmel said, cities need to be heterogeneous. And by raising the prices of rent so much, the first ones to be kicked out of the city were the younger generations. After that, only well-established elderly people could afford to stay in the city center. Things started getting so out of hand in Venice's historical center that UNESCO itself threatened to put the city on its list of heritage sites in danger of severe damage. That's tough, huh? The city is still trying to find ways to mitigate the effects of tourism. The first thing they did was to ban those huge cruise ships from stopping in the city's historical area. Oh, and the city produced a tourism fee. Normally, anyone sleeping in the historical center already pays a fee. But nowadays, tourists have to register their entry and pay a daily fee for exploring the main island. 
The profits from this fee are directed toward making life in Venice's city center more affordable. Hopefully, these policies will allow Venetians to move back to Venice's city center. Ciao!